Hello. In this video, we'll talk about one of the most sacred deductions in the entire Internal Revenue Code, the Home Mortgage Interest Deduction. Now, the Home Mortgage Interest Deduction is what some call sacred. Sacred, the only time I've really heard the word sacred is when talking about sacred cows. It's interesting because people, some people don't really understand why exactly the home mortgage interest deduction is sacred. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the rules that apply to the home mortgage interest deduction in general. And then I want to talk about the history of the home mortgage interest, interest deduction, social policy, why exactly it's allowed and why exactly it is considered sacred, the effect of the standard deduction in terms of whether somebody might be affected in terms of social policy, and finally, some interesting issues involving the home mortgage interest deduction. So the first topic we're going to cover is the application with respect to the tax consequences of mortgage interest deduction, whether you can actually deduct and what actually goes into the deduction. It's important to understand that the tax year does make a difference, and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 made a real difference between the uh, mortgage interest deduction and what we had from the 1986 Tax Act going on all the way until um, the end of 2017, so before 2018. And you're going to learn the basic principles. And at the end, the end of this video, please watch through the very end, because at the very end of the video, I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about one last final topic about what's different versus 2017, which is what you have here and before, and 2018 going forward. Because it's possible, even if you're 2018 and before, a taxpayer may still have a mortgage prior to 2018. And with that, it's important to understand because you're going to have to ask when was the mortgage actually taken out past uh, 2017 to so 2018 on makes a big difference. So please watch through to the end. And we're going to talk about the basic principles now. Now, before we talk about the specific application of the home mortgage interest deduction, recall from previous videos, we talked about the big three activities when it comes to deductions. Remember, business activities, investment activities, and personal activities. If you recall, the general rule says that business and investment activities can be deducted, but the general rule for personal is that unless otherwise specified, a personal deduction cannot be deducted. So the home mortgage interest deduction involves personal property. It involves personal property. That's what we're talking about. So that's the first thing to understand. When we're talking about the home mortgage interest deduction, we're really referring to personal property. Now, it can also apply to business or investment property, rental property, but this is really a carve out and why it's so sacred. It's all about home ownership. That's one of our thought of as in America, one of our um, main dreams is for possibly for you to own your own home. It's a huge deal. So the first thing to understand is that the home mortgage interest deduction applies to a qualified residence. A qualified residence. And we're going to talk about what the definition of a qualified residence is. And there's really two different definitions possible. There's really two different definitions. The first definition of a qualified residence is a principal residence. Now a principal residence means that it's the residence that a taxpayer lives in for a majority of the tax year, more than half of the year. That's considered the taxpayer's principal residence. So if there is a mortgage on that property, and we'll talk about the specific mortgages possible, it's possible that the taxpayer can deduct the mortgage interest on that property. And by the way, there's other things. I know you're thinking of, okay, mortgage interest, it's the interest on the mortgage alone, right? And that is normally what we think of when we think of mortgage interest, but it also can apply to points and some other things. But think about it. The interest and the points on that mortgage, that's, that's the main thing. Now, the other property that qualifies for um, a qualified residence is what we call a personal residence. A personal residence. Now, a personal residence is any residence where a taxpayer lives for greater than or equal to 14 days during the taxable year. It's possible that a taxpayer can have more than one personal residence. Maybe someone owns multiple vacation homes. 
You have a vacation home in Aspen. You have a vacation home in Florida. You got a vacation home in California. You can only use one personal residence and one principal residence. The qualified residence rule for the mortgage interest deduction allows both a one principal residence. If you think about it, you can only have one principal residence. It's the residence you've lived in for majority of the tax year, more than half the year. So you can only have one. It's only possible to have one. You can't have two, right? So you can only have one. But a personal residence, you can have many, but you can only use one. So it's whatever personal residence that the taxpayer designates. Whichever one the taxpayer designates. So that is a qualified residence. It's these two properties. It's two properties potential. You don't have to have both. Um, you, you can have one, you can have none, right? Well, you don't get a deduction if you, don't, if you have none. You don't have to have both, but you can have a principal residence and one personal residence. So what kinds of financing or mortgage are covered by this? So there's two types. And again, and you're going to see that both of these, the, the mortgage interest and again, the points and other things, but mortgage interest and the points are what we generally think of when we think about this. There's two types that can be deducted on these on the qualified residence, which again is the two properties. So the first is what we call acquisition indebtedness. Acquisition indebtedness. Now acquisition indebtedness is the plain vanilla type of indebtedness we think of when we think of a buying a home. It's the mortgage you take out to buy, build, improve or possibly even refinance a qualified residence so one of these residences above and it has to be secured by the residence either principal or personal residence now acquisition indebtedness has a limit at the time of this video the limit is one million dollars but you might be watching the video at a different time where the amount is different so you have to look at this but it's a million dollars at this time and an interesting thing is at this time of the video it's not inflation adjusted i'm going to talk about that when I talk about the history in a moment. So that's the first type of acquisition indebtedness. I'm sorry, that, that's the first type of indebtedness or uh, mortgage that you can deduct the interest and the points and whatnot. The other type is called home equity indebtedness. Home equity, 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 right? Home equity indebtedness. And home equity indebtedness Sorry, home equity indebtedness. This is also limited, and I'll explain what it is. This one can be a mortgage to purchase anything. So acquisition indebtedness, again, is to buy, build, or improve a qualified residence, and there's a special rule for refinancing of a residence. Home equity indebtedness can be used to purchase anything. It can be used to purchase to pay for um, your children's schooling. And go to university or private schooling. Can be used to buy a car. Can be used to buy anything you want. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Your business. Home equity indebtedness can be used to purchase anything, so it's not limited. But the key is that it must be secured by the equity. That's why it's called the home equity indebtedness, by the equity that you have in your principal residence or your personal residence. It's limited to the equity how much equity you build it up in that specific um, residence that you're securing. And that's at this time is limited to $100,000. Again, check when you're watching this video, it might have changed. And again, it's not inflation adjusted at the time of this video. You can have both of these. You can do both acquisition and home equity indebtedness. You can do both of those. So at the time of this video, you could potentially take mortgage interest deduction on up to $1.1 million. Now the limit on acquisition indebtedness I mentioned of a million dollars and the home equity indebtedness of $100,000 at the time of this video, that's on both properties. That's the principal residence plus the personal residence. And that is not the amount of actual interest you can deduct. It's not a million and a hundred thousand. It's on the mortgage, the actual amount of the mortgage. So the interest on that mortgage. That's a pretty large number, 1.1 million, at least at the time of this video. I mean, you might be watching this years in the future, but that's nothing, okay? And by then, I hope that they, they adjust it for inflation. So that's really what, what we have going on here. That's the basic rule. 
Again, it's important that when you watch this video, please check your rules to see if it still applies. If the principal residence rule, the personal residence rule, you can do, again, one principal residence, well, that's all you have, personal residence, acquisition indebtedness, home equity indebtedness, but that's really how it's been. So now I want to talk about the interesting stuff that many of you are probably wondering about. Why did I talk about it being a sacred cow? Why is it sacred? So let's talk about the history of this deduction. I love history. I'm sure you do too. So at one time in our tax law history, a taxpayer could deduct any personal interest, even on your credit card. Can you believe that? any personal interest, even on a credit card. Well, after the Tax Act of 1986, we have the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 come around. The personal deductions were severely limited, especially when it came to interest. And the only interest deduction that was allowed for personal, well, there was two. There was the home mortgage interest deduction, which we're referring to, and the student loan interest. But the home mortgage interest is the one that really was huge. It was it was widely accepted by by um, different by the different uh, political parties, and actually on the floor, one of the senators, Senator Pryor, actually said, "This is the most sacred of all deductions. The home mortgage interest deduction is the most sacred of all deductions." So we went from deducting everything to trying to close and saying, "No, you can't deduct any personal deductions." But then they said, "Wait, wait, 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 wait." We can't get rid of this home mortgage interest deduction. And you might be saying, why? And it all has to do with social policy. Congress says that it's the American dream to own a home. So we talked about the history. Now we're talking about social policy. So this leads to the history, to the social policy, why it's been kept, and why it really is sacred. At the time of this video, there's some potential tax reform that's being debated. Whether it actually will happen, we'll see. But one of the things that they're proposing is eliminating almost all the NOS deductions, but they're keeping two of the most sacred deductions of the entire, enti I'm sorry, in the entire Internal Revenue Code. And the main one is the home mortgage interest deduction. Because again, American society views and has always viewed as owning a house as something that's just part of American culture. Does the home mortgage interest deduction really incentivize buying a home instead of renting? Well, let me talk about something interesting that you might not think about. Back in 1986, when the when this deduction was kept, interest rates, so interest rates back then on mortgages, take a guess, 14 to 15 percent. We had the savings and loan crisis of the mid, um, early to mid 1980s, and home mortgage interest rates, on average, were 14 percent, 15 percent. 14 to 15% average. That's very high. Well, back then, if you could deduct the mortgage interest on, on your mortgage, which is 14 15%, if you bought a house for $100,000, you're talking about paying potentially $14,000 in the year. That can actually add up. At the time of this video, interest rates have severely gone down and they might go back up. It, it, it depends on the year. Right now, they're on average between 3 and 4%. Right now, the big issue is does home mortgage interest deduction, is it really as sacred as it used to be? Because the effect of 3 to 4%, if you have that $100,000 mortgage, is only 3000 to 4000 See that? If you have a $100,000 mortgage back in the 1980s, 1986, when the interest rates were 14 to 15%, that could be $14,000 of home mortgage interest. But today, it could be $3,000. Big difference. Especially when you consider the standard deduction. The standard deduction might be, depending on what it's set when you're viewing this video, if it's very high, the taxpayer might not even get to that because, again, the interest rates might not be high enough, so it might be quite low. If it's if the interest rates when you're watching this video are 3 to 4%, many taxpayers are not going to be able to take advantage of the standard, I'm sorry, of this itemized deduction because they're going to get the standard deduction, and guess what? They're not going to be able to benefit from this home mortgage interest even if they buy a house. So studies view this in economics. They view, does this, does this deduction really encourage home buying? And what many researchers have really focused on is really this. When interest rates are higher, yes. But when they're lower, they don't really, it, that, that's not really the case. What ends up happening is that this deduction usually encourages, because the limits are so high, taxpayers to purchase 
higher homes because the higher your amount is, the more it's going to be and it potentially could be over the standard deduction. You see that? If the standard deduction, when you're watching this video, I'm just making up a number, is $30,000 and let's say the interest rate is 3%, if you have a $500,000 house, that's going to be $500,000 times 3% for the year interest rate, that's going to be $15,000. But if you have a million dollar house, that's going to be 3% of that. That's going to be $30,000. And if your standard deduction is $30,000 for the year and you have other itemized deductions, you're going to start to be able to take advantage. So it actually starts to go over when you get up to that higher limit on the amount. You see that? So basically, when interest rates are lower, studies have shown that it doesn't really make the... Um, doesn't really incentivize taxpayers to, okay, instead of renting, I'm going to buy a home. What it does is the taxpayers that are already going to buy a home might buy a more expensive home, which this goes into an equity issue because it's saying, hey, this is only helping the wealthy people because they can afford the more expensive houses. So it's an equity issue, a fairness issue, because if you can't overcome that standard reduction, you have an equity issue, especially if the interest rates are lower because those people that might only be able to buy, um, you know, might have to buy a, a very low cost house because they don't have much money, they're not going to be able to get over that standard deduction and they don't get this tax benefit. So that's why I want to talk about the standard deduction. Finally, the last thing is there's been some interesting issues that involve the home mortgage interest deduction over the years I've seen. And the main one I want to mention is that at the time of this video, Again, the limits on acquisition indebtedness, a million dollars, and home equity indebtedness, a hundred thousand dollars. That's for a single owner. That's also for a married owner. That's also if you're married filing joint. Interesting, right? Single and married filing joint have the same amount. This is technically part of the marriage penalty. When you get married, you have certain issues like this. Now, people were trying to abuse the system. What they would do is they would do married filing separate and spouses would, okay, I'm going to take my portion of the interest, you take your portion of the interest, and they would be able to increase their amounts from $1 million to $2 million and $100,000 to $200,000. Interesting, right? So then Congress said, oh, we, we see that. So they put language in there that actually said, oh, you can only take half if you're going to do that. So it said $500,000 for acquisition indebtedness and $50,000 for home equity if you're doing married filing separate. But what if you own a property through joint tenants? Or two individuals own, two friends own um, a house and they live in the house together and they each pay half of the interest on the mortgage. Well, interesting enough, guess what happens? They both still have the $1 million limit and the $50,000 limit. So this is something where it might actually encourage people not to get married. It, this is something where you see, and this is very interesting in the tax code, there's other areas in the tax code, it's a benefit not to marry. Not to marry. In some states where it's hard to get common law marriage by living in the same house, maybe because you have to do it, you have to be together for a long time, maybe common law marriage doesn't exist, this can actually benefit if you have a very expensive house, a very... Um, if you had, again, a $2 million house, you could take all the interest of the $2 million and, and um, $200,000 extra because think about it. You have two owners. Let's say they're a man and a woman. They decide not to get married. They each pay half of the, um, of the interest on the mortgage. They have a $2 million uh, mortgage. Let's not worry about home equity indebtedness. Let's just say they have a $2 million mortgage and it's all acquisition indebtedness. Okay. Well, guess what? They can deduct it because each one's viewed to have a million and they're paying half the interest. Interesting, right? But if you're married, you can only do a million. So if they were married in that case, they can only do one million. So this creates an interesting issue. This goes back to the equity, that one of our, our principal pillars of tax policy. So the final thing I want to talk about with regard to the mortgage interest deduction, I mentioned I would talk about this earlier when we talked about the application of tax law and how it actually works is the effect of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, the TCJA 2017. So really, the rules that we just talked about really came about from the, the 1986 Tax 
reform and the uh, tax code 1986, and they really have applied throughout. Um, you know, before that, it was a lot different. Um, again, I mentioned that uh, interest even on credit cards could be deducted, and then the 1986 Tax Act came and made these things like acquisition indebtedness, home equity indebtedness. The Tax um, Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, really the application really stays the same but for a few differences. Okay, It's really important to understand these differences. And you have to really look at the, the year with respect to some items. Okay, So we're going to talk about the TCJA, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, and how it affects things. And how it affects things. So really, um, the first thing is that 2018 on... Um, home equity indebtedness. So home equity indebtedness, 2018 on, and this um, this green color. I want you to, to if I if I do anything here on on this on this uh, video, in the green color, this is um, 2018 on with respect to the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. So 2018 and on, there is no home equity indebtedness allowed. So you can't even take the home equity indebtedness. That no longer is allowed. So remember, it was a hundred thousand dollars before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So that was um, twenty or nineteen eighty six through twenty seventeen. Twenty eighteen on. So going forward, there's the home equity indebtedness is not allowed. So that's now gone. With respect to acquisition indebtedness, this is another issue. So twenty eighteen on for the acquisition indebtedness. Acquisition indebtedness. Really what you have to do is you have to look at when the question becomes when was the debt incurred or taken out, okay? When was it incurred or taken out? If the mortgage was taken on, there's some specific rules regarding the application of this and when the closing and whatnot takes place, but I want to be clear, if it's 12, 15, 17, or before, then we apply the one million dollar old old rules for the acquisition and deadness. But if it's after this date, after 12, 15, 17, then instead of being one million, which was the old rule, it's now going to be capped at seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. All right, it's going to be capped at seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So this affects. The acquisition indebtedness. This is still allowed under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, the acquisition indebtedness. Okay, this is still allowed, but you have to look at when the debt was actually incurred, taken out. And again, I'm not going into the very specifics of, you know, this 1215 date and what exactly that meant, you know, binding contract versus closing and all that stuff, because you had to close by March of the following year and whatnot. We're not going to go into that. But if the debt was taken out 12, 15, 17, or before, you got to apply the old rule. And that's going forward. That's going into 2018, 2019, and going forward. Okay? Even though home equity indebtedness is not allowed 2018, 2019, going forward. However, if the debt is taken out after 12, 15, 17, then 2018, 2019, and, and so on, the interest on the home on the acquisition indebtedness up to $750,000 of the principal amount of the loan is deductible, but anything beyond that is not deductible. So you can see a huge distinction because let's say you have an, a million a million dollar uh, debt in um, uh, acquisition indebtedness, and it was taken out in 2017. Let's say in July of 2017, you close in 2017 as well. Well, um, you're going to be able to take the full million dollar the interest on the full million dollars of that debt. But if you took that out. Um, the next year, let's say July of 2018, so after 12, 15, 17, then you can only deduct the interest up to 750,000. The interest on the remaining 250,000 to get to 1 million is not going to is going to be disallowed, not allowed. So that's very important to understand, and that does make a big difference. But overall, this, the rules are still the same. The only difference, again, is that um, 2018 on, you can't take home equity indebtedness regardless of when the debt was incurred. But for acquisition indebtedness, you have to ask. When was the debt incurred? If it was incurred 12, 15, 17, so 12, 15 of 2017 or before, then you can still take $1 million, the old amount, even going forward, 2018, 2019, going forward into the future. But if the debt was taken on, um, incurred after 12, 15 of 2017, so going forward 2018, 2019, you have a new debt, then you can only take in, um, the interest is only deductible 
on the $750,000 portion. So I hope that helps you understand. Again, the same discussion still applies. The same discussion still applies. So I hope you've enjoyed this video regarding one of the um, biggest seductions out there and the importance of this seduction with respect to various taxpayers.